Okay. Welcome to What a Word is Worth, a space for creative minds to speak about viable ways to heal the world through writing and other inventive mediums. This is your host, Marianela Medrano. I am the founder of Palabra Training Center, where words are giving us medicine. And today, my guest is Neil Silverblatt, who is the founder, director of Voices of Poetry since 2012. He has curated and presented more than 400 poetry events at various venues in Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, including Provincetown's Art Association and Museum, the Rubin Museum of Art, McNally Jackson Books, and Jefferson Market Library in New York City. He has gone virtually all over the East Coast <laughs> with these uh, events. Uh, those events have featured acclaimed poets, including former U.S. Poet Laureate Robert Pinsky and Pulitzer Prize winner Frank Vidar, as well as those who have not yet published a work. So it's a very inclusive um, venue. Neil's poems have appeared in numerous prints and online, online literary journals and anthologies, including Plum Poetry Journal, Monk Egg Review, Lily Poetry Review, uh, Tefere, uh, which means the glory or splendor in Hebrew, I learned. And um, that's a journal, American Journal of Poetry and uh, Tikkun Daily. And also his poem, Burned Offering, was selected by uh, Massachusetts Poetry as their poem of the moment. His work has also been selected for various anthologies, including Collateral Damage, Culinary Poems, and he is the author of several poetry collections, so far so good, which is a very clever title, and present tense. His most recent poetry collection, Past Imperfect, another clever title, was nominated for the Massachusetts Book Award in Poetry. Neil has been nominated several times for a Pushcart Prize and has received several grants from Massachusetts Cultural Council and, Council. and in his spare time, he battled stage four colon cancer. Welcome, Neil. Thank you, Marianella. So delighted to be here. Yes, it is a pleasure to finally have you here to join this conversation. So, Tell us about your encounter with poetry and um, particularly when did you realize that poetry was seated in you? And it, the question, it has another leg. Do you subscribe to the idea that poetry is healing? To answer the second question first, absolutely. Um, uh, but let me, I'll return to that in a moment, but yes, absolutely. Um, in terms of my first encounter with poetry, um, when I was a little boy growing up in Manhattan, my mother would take me to our local library, which was Tompkins Square Library, mm -hmm. uh, um, a venue, a library which is, holds, holds a special spot in my heart. And there, the children's librarian would read to me in her wonderful Jamaican accent, mm -hmm. stories of Winnie the Pooh and and A. A. Milne's poems, and um, you know, now we are six and and a, a garden of verse, and that was my first introduction to it. But it, they were children's poems, and uh, as you know, when I was a child, I spake as a child. Later on, when I was in high school, I had a wonderful uh, English teacher who introduced me to what I want to call is serious poetry and poetry 
which made a difference. And at the time, in the 60s and 70s, poetry was making a difference. We had people like Robert Bly and Allen Ginsberg, uh, who were really speaking out, um, poets against the war, who were really speaking out, uh, expressing themselves through poetry. Um, and that was a revelation to me. Um, uh, hearing Yevtushenko read at Lincoln Center was a revelation to me. Uh, reading Yeats's poems was a revelation. Um, when I was a little bit older, going to see a play called For Color Girls Who've, Committed, Who've Considered Suicide When the Rainbow is Enough, uh, initially at the Public Theater and then on Broadway. Um, and it, it really was a revelation in the sense that this wasn't just um, as great as Shelley and Byron and, and Wordsworth are, this wasn't just poetry which worked on the page. This was poetry which made a difference, made a difference in people's lives. Um, it was for good reason that a Dr. King spoke in the language of poetry. It was for good reason that the uh, civil rights activists uh, spoke in the language of poetry. Um, it was a language that could convey a great deal in not a great deal of, of words. In fact, the, the art of poetry, what intrigues me about it is the ability to say a great deal without using a lot of words. Uh, a prose writer can describe um, abject poverty in a chapter. Philip Levine manages to do it in a sentence when he wrote, um, uh, we were 20 for such a short time and always in the wrong clothes. And just in that one phrase, you immediately know what he means. Um, writers can go on in paragraphs about uh, depression um, and, and suicidal ideation, but Robert Frost does it in one sentence, I am well acquainted with the night. Uh, Jane Kenyon does it in three words, let evening come. That, that, that not paucity of words, but that sparseness of words, that cleanness of line really appealed to me. And it still does. But to go back to your second question, do I regard poetry as healing? Absolutely. And I'm not just saying that uh, in a figurative sense. Um, my doctors, uh, who I cannot speak highly enough of, are still mystified by my continued verticality uh, in the face of uh, stage four cancer. And, and they said, you know, what do you credit to? And I said, uh, you know, poetry and perverse stubbornness in that order. Um, I still have much more to read. I still have much more to write. Um, I still have much more to hear and much more to present. Um, so uh, absolutely poetry is, is healing. Absolutely. I, I firmly believe that uh, poetry is part of what I will, and I call it, comes out with devout agnostic, what I call is tikkun olam, the healing of the world. Uh, and poetry is part of that process, whether it's Merwin or, or uh, or Akhmatova, or um, Mayakovsky, or Lorca, or Neruda, mm -hmm. uh, or any of the, or the or Adrian Rich, or any of the great poets of the 20th century. Um, uh, all of their work has contributed to the healing of the world. Yeah. So you've been um, hearing and breathing poetry for a long time. I have um, been. I, I, and I, what, is, what did Mark Strand said? I've been eating poetry. Yes, <laughs> that's wonderful, and that and that uh, perhaps uh, aside from your stubbornness, account for your vert verticality. I like that. Um, in your poem, you are right. You grapple with the worth of, or value of poetry. Yes. Tell the listeners what writing this poem did um, for you. Well, it was it, the, the, <laughs> the origin of the poem is was somewhat funny. I, I, I shared with a friend of mine who didn't realize that I wrote poetry because I, I didn't publicize that fact much. Um, mm -hmm. And um, in his inartful way, mm -hmm. he, he's a dear friend. Um, mm -hmm. He responded that, that poetry was about as useful as, in his words, tits on a bull. His words, okay. not mine. <laughs> So the poem was written in response to that comment. 
and the you are right uh, was meant very much tongue in cheek. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it is true. Um, you know, uh, Auden wrote two contradictory phrases. Mm -hmm. um, he said that the poets are are not the uh, are, that poetry in itself accomplishes nothing. Right. Um, that uh, that poets don't legislate. Poets are not the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Uh, that's too much for us to ask. But in the very same token, the same poet Auden wrote that um, in September 1, 1939, all I have is a voice to undo the folded lie. Um, so he, he recognizes the importance of poets and poetry. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the truth is somewhere in between. The you are right uh, was meant both in jest and in seriousness that yes, of course, a poet, a poem, a, a poetry itself will never um, stop, uh, you know, will, will stop a plague, stop you know, suffering, mm -hmm. will never heal a nation. But it's a, it's a step. It's a step of, I mean, the, I, I looked at the famous painting Guernica, mm -hmm. by Picasso, mm -hmm. painted in 1937 after the bombing yeah. of the village, the Guernica. Yeah. It didn't stop fascism in Spain, it didn't end fascism in Germany. Um, it didn't undo, it didn't put an end to human suffering. Sadly, that human suffering continued and still continues to this day. But it, it shed a light on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It shed a light on it, which perhaps only art can shed. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that when we read uh, Neruda's, um, I'm explaining a few things mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the bombing of another Spanish village. Did that stop the bombing? No. Did it did it shed a light on it on it so that we understand it even now, 70 years later, 80 years later? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, in a way that probably I don't think anything else could shed. Yeah. Um so the so you are right all began, it began mm -hmm. with a funny background. Mm -hmm. It was a serious message to it. And it ends with um with with a kind of indictment of, of critics on poetry yeah i really i mean the whole poem i actually have it um right here in my computer oh um, thank you very much <laughs> and um i like can i read the end of then? course by all means please i would love to hear your, yeah. your in your voice yeah hold on i'm i'm trying to find it here probably, probably, so, the, the, probably the, the last two verses of it Yes, um, it says, it's really clever. So tell me then, why tyrants fear us so? Why our work is cast upon flames? Why our pages are ripped from books like flayed skin? Tell me then, why bullets are wasted on us when they can be so better used on critics? <laughs> I was thinking so, <laughs> I, when, when I wrote that I was I was thinking of the Stalin purges. Uh, when when Stalin when Stalin purged, he didn't purge restaurant reviewers, he didn't purge book uh, sports columnists or movie reviewers. Mm. He purged poets. <laughs> they were the ones he was most frightened of. Yeah, yeah. So there, there, because there is the power in naming, right? Yes. Is that what it is? That that when we named, we established um, situations, things, people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, your poems are written from life's events. They borrow from from life, yours and others, and um, as. Uh, there is so so much humor in them, um, but there seems to always be a political commentary threaded through your poetry. Yes, is this a correct reading of it? There, I mean, a lot of all, all, I wouldn't say it's, it applies to all of my poems. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure um, if, it, if, it, if it does. It's something that I'm not striving for. Mm -hmm. um, Certainly, I'm a, I'm a, as are you, a, a product of our time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, we both grew up in, in a very turbulent time. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, we are living through another turbulent time, sadly. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I and and that is that shaped me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that that shaped my outlook. Yeah. Still does actually. Yeah. Um, but in terms of yes, I, I think all of writing, mm -hmm. certainly all of poetry, is what did Tip O'Neill say? All politics is personal. Uh, yeah. All poetry is personal. Right. Um, right. Even if the poet is writing about a Grecian urn, mm -hmm. he or she is writing about how he perceives that Grecian urn. Mm -hmm. So by mm -hmm. definition, um, even if the poet is not writing in the first person, um, he is writing about his perception of the world. I should add yeah. to that the caveat that it is always dangerous to assume that the person described in the poem and the poet are one of the, the same person. Absolutely. Uh, that, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a, that is a peril that we, that we mm -hmm. you know, that is, that is not always the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is not always the case. Um, yeah. The, I think the worst bit of advice, and it's the most common advice given mm -hmm. to poets and writers, is mm -hmm. write what you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I've given advice to aspiring poets and writers, I will say to them, write what you know, but the corollary is no more. No more, right. Be curious about what you don't know, Absolutely. right? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Be, I mean, they're just, mm -hmm. let the passion of curiosity burn brightly mm -hmm. in you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. read, read twice as much as what you write. Mm -hmm. Hear yes. twice as much as what you say. Right. The idea of writing with all our senses, right? To be tuning absolutely to yes. the different um, yeah. that is so vitally important. And and mm -hmm. and and to feel and and let let the poem take you someplace that you've never been. And let let it let it drip on your hands. Mm -hmm. You should walk yeah. away from the poem stained. It should yeah. it should be on your clothing. Well, that's um, that's how I feel with your poetry. That it is stained with life. It's infused yes, with life. Yes, yes. Uh, I just uh, I, there are there are so many such wonderful images out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you have a very curious eye. You have the curiosity of things. And yes. So um, before I go to um, another one of your poems. Let's talk about this journey, um, this hanging out with colon cancer, stage four uh, colon cancer, and how it has um, impacted your view of the world and your use of words. Great question. Um, it, it, I would not recommend the experience to anybody. <laughs> No, don't do this at home. No, don't don't do this. Don't try this at home. D don't, no, it's not worth it. You know, it's better to be tongue-tied and be healthy than to have cancer and be prolific in writing. So don't, uh, I would not recommend this. But um, <laughs> on, seriously, when I was diagnosed, um, I thought, you know, now is a chance in the same way that I hope to demystify poetry, mm -hmm. people think of poetry, you know, mm -hmm. a cast in, in stone and marble. Mm -hmm. I was hoping to demystify cancer as well mm -hmm. and to write about it from the vantage point of this is what a cancer patient looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm it. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be it, but mm -hmm. I'm it. Mm -hmm. uh, let other people see it through my eyes. Mm -hmm. Get a sense as to what I'm going through. Yeah. Um, maybe then they'll have a sense of empathy, perhaps. Mm -hmm. I have compassion for people who are going through this. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, we, we forget a couple of years ago, a number of people were trying to undo the Affordable Care Act. Yeah. And I thought, I took that rather personally. You know, mm -hmm. People, why do they want to kill me? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I thought, this is a chance to, I don't want to say make a difference, because that sounds too too high an aspiration mm -hmm. but I wanted to get us give a sense as to what I was going through so that others who are going through something similar mm -hmm. would hear yeah that sounds familiar yeah yeah 
Um, Audre Lorde, who also went through experienced cancer, so many right. writers and poets have, have dealt with cancer. Um, mm -hmm. Max Ritvo, uh, another fine poet mm -hmm. gone far too soon, wrote beautifully about his cancer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Lucy Brock Boydo, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. um, Jane Kenyon. Um, they, they offer us an insight. They offer us um, a chance to know beyond our own personal knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, um, you know, I've never, I've never, I haven't yet at least ventured into hell, but mm -hmm. thanks to Dante's tour guide, I feel like I know the streets and cobb cobblestones a little bit better. So this was my own little, uh, my own little, um, divine comedy, as it were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and the phrase comedy was chosen deliberately. Mm -hmm. Uh, he wasn't being entirely sarcastic. Right. Um, you know, we, we, we there there is a, there is a comedic element to it. Um, to life, you mean? Yes, to exactly. Life. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um. So it was a challenge. It, mm -hmm. it certainly was a challenge to find the right words. I couldn't just I couldn't just have one long continuous yawp right. on the page or yowl on the page. I, I mm -hmm. mean, I could, but Alan Ginsberg beat me to it. <laughs> um but I could I could try to find the words for it. I could and mm -hmm. I'm still trying to. I'm mm -hmm. still that is still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So so it's two things um that I want to um kind of go back to it, what you were saying, your, you know, with the the uh, political decisions that are taking in this country where you know it feels like a, a, it feels personal <laughs> it feels yes. like it's yes. an attack so um your your reaction was why do they want to kill me and historically you know to think um how black and brown or people of color bipoc uh communities have been subjected to genocide, yes. um, a genocide that it's, you know, it's hard to, to label, but it's happening on the list. So, um, you know, that's what I'm saying that your curiosity, even as you're going through that, your eyes are going to catching these things. Um, what what, it, what Lucille, Lucille Clifton wrote her wonderful, wrote many great poems, mm. but uh, there's a wonderful poem called, Won't You Celebrate With Me? Mm -hmm. I was still Clifton. Mm -hmm. you know, every day they every day they tried to kill me and failed. Yeah. 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 Um it just I I read that. Um mm -hmm. or I read Galway Cannell's poem Wait. Mm -hmm. It sounds mm -hmm. it sounds funny perhaps to somebody mm -hmm. who's not quote unquote into poetry to say, mm -hmm. oh my God, how a poem really touched you. But it really yeah. does. Yeah. It really yeah. does. Uh yeah. you take a poem like Wait by Galway Cannell. Mm -hmm. written for a grad student who was contemplating suicide. Mm -hmm. And Cannell wrote this for that student. Wait, you're tired, but everybody's tired, yeah. but no one is tired enough. Yeah. And I cannot describe for you um, mm -hmm. how that touched me or how mm -hmm. Lucille Clifton's simple celebration of won't you celebrate yeah. with me? That is, yeah. Or the blessing of the boats. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or again, Cadell's uh, St. Francis and the Sow. Yeah. Um, really touched me deeply. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and hang in there kind of element to it. Yeah, yeah. And the break, you know, the breakdowns that we go through. And, you know, I was, um, as I was um, reading your work in, in preparation to our conversation, I came upon your your poem um, that you wrote for the uh, Japanese uh, joinery practice. Uh, you oh, call it kin yes. yeah, but I, there is another name for it, which is kensogi. Yes. So I was laughing because I have a poem. Oh um, really? Oh that, yeah, kensogi. And even though both of us are 
um, kind of grappling with the same theme of, you know, break breakdowns, we are doing it from very different angles. Yeah. Um, but the idea of restoring, remaking, rebirthing is involved. In your poem, you announce first it must be broken. Yes. Then and only then can you start. Yes. You um, remind us that we must be reduced into dust yes. in order to be recreated. And yeah. it has that biblical um, yes. reference. That, uh, that, that, there, was a, there was a definite biblical uh, orientation to that. Yeah, yeah. So in that theme, though, what is the rebirthing you are, you are most proud of in your life? being here being alive um, mm -hmm. um giving giving um somebody the other said and, and i it's funny I, when i formed voices of poetry mm -hmm. um i never imagined it would blossom the way it has mm -hmm. i mm -hmm. never envisioned um that we'd have as many members of voices of poetry around the globe as mm -hmm. we do i never imagined mm -hmm. that i'd be still organizing events mm -hmm. um and I'm getting ready, if the good Lord is willing and the creek don't rise, to go up to the Berkshires uh, in June for our mm -hmm. fourth annual event mm -hmm. um, at the Mount. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, tomorrow I'm going to Manhattan to host our event at McNally Jackson Books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that rebirth, that, mm -hmm. that um, the notion of, of bringing poetry in, mm -hmm. in the most amazing spaces. I'll tell you, right, I, I, I love all of our events equally. Mm -hmm. but we had one event at a boxing gym in Patterson, New Jersey. Marianella, I wish you could have seen this. Uh, you, would have, you, would have, you would have birthed with, proud, with pride and with <laughs> laughter. We show up as poets do, you know, in our Sunday best with our books and sheets of paper and the athletes are there working out on punching bags and they look at us and we look at them and we know that one of us is out of place and it's not them <laughs> suffice it to say that it was they stuck they hung around to watch mm -hmm. us we had mm -hmm. we had a dean of students at nyu in columbia and the head of the mfa program there and we also had amateur boxers there and it was so wonderful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what voices of poetry really is, yeah, right? And, and, and it's it, it's not um it's not a fancy you know you know, it, we, by God it's the opposite of fancy. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. it's a very um, grassroots you mm -hmm. know level organization. I, I mm -hmm. that is my political orientation, mm -hmm. uh, and that will remain my political orientation to the day they put me in the earth. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, um, so that, I love that rebirth. There's the, as a devout agnostic, the only resurrection that I firmly believe in is the resurrection of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in the, in Mahler's second symphony, mm -hmm. a piece very dear to my heart. Um, called the Resurrection Symphony. It's not the resurrection of, of Jesus. It's not the resurrection of Lazarus. It's the resurrection of the human soul. Mm -hmm. the, um, that what has not killed us, doesn't make us stronger, doesn't make us stronger in the broken parts. Sorry, Hemingway. Um, it makes us more, hopefully, more aware of other suffering. Mm -hmm. It makes yeah. us more sensitive to the suffering of others, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it ignites the sense of common humanity. I know. Uh, yes, it, yeah, yeah. it should. Yeah. It should. Yeah, yeah. So, so going back though, in order for it to be a, a rebirth, there has to be though, going back to the Kinsogu um, idea, that there has to be this falling apart into pieces, yes. right? So, um, what are some, what is this rebirth stemming from? 
Like what uh, is what is what is what was killed in you? Well, it's, it, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not sure I can answer that very easily. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, um, undergoing cancer, mm -hmm. undergoing surgeries, mm -hmm. being told initially that I had two to four years to live, and I'm now approaching six years. Um, and then going you were like, chemo. I'll show you. Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, um, I'll, I'll show myself, actually. Um, and then going through chemotherapy, mm -hmm. where you, from one day to the next, um, you don't recognize yourself anymore. Yeah. It, it yeah. is. Um, and then literally losing all this little furry stuff on top of my head mm -hmm. um, and being bald, as, being bald as a tomato. Mm. And I have to tell you, I wasn't a handsome bald. Mm. Your Brenner, I was not. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I would look like, I look like a plucked chicken. Mm. Um, and not a very handsome plucked chicken at that. <laughs> um so it was not an edible chicken no it was not it was not a, it, purdue would have said no um so when i wrote so when somebody i forget who now somebody uh, brought to my attention the japanese art of repairing Enjoy. broken vessels mm -hmm. where the history of repair becomes part of the beauty of the object absolutely it's rather the most than, yeah rather than something to be ashamed of or, or right. try to conceal that yeah. the history of repair, not only is it, it's highlighted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with gold or silver mm -hmm. or some precious metal mm -hmm. so that you actually see where the breaks occurred. If the scars, you know, the beauties in the scars. Yeah, exactly. The, beauty, the beauties in the scar, which was yeah. a radical departure from how I was perceiving it because we always mm -hmm. think of, you know, people want to hide scars, mm -hmm. people want to, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. conceal disfigurement. Yeah. This was where you embraced the breakage, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where you say um, there was a wonderful photographer here on the Cape, uh, Julia Cumes, C-U-M-E-S, mm -hmm. who did a photo essay of women who had battled breast cancer. Yes, yes, I think I have. And women who had gotten yeah. tattoos mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in the area of where their breasts had been. Yeah. And it was beautiful and, and so eloquent i've seen it yes um and instead of recoiling mm -hmm. of course you immediately recoil in the horror at the association with breast cancer mm -hmm. you can't make that beautiful but mm -hmm. but the notion of taking that hurt and that pain mm -hmm. and finding some beauty in it mm -hmm. and and creating beauty around it yeah was a yeah. was an eye-opener to me yeah yeah and you know, you 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 do a similar thing in your poem, Hang. What is the I have it here? Hang Strom. Oh yes, I was hoping you would mention that. Yes. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like it's it's really you're moving it with the same theme. There. Yes, yes. It's a beautiful, beautiful poem. Thank you. I'm very I'm very um that I'm very happy with that with the way that came out. Yeah, and it captures what what you were saying just now, um, that idea of going, you know, to the to the broken area. Yes. And you know, as you were saying in the other poem, you know, you you have to work with the dust and yes. the the um, the now beautiful to then create that, that yes. beauty. And that's interesting. Uh, you should mention that because the ending of that poem, mm -hmm. I, I I left that. I don't know with with you. Sometimes it happens with you that you leave a poem aside for a moment. You have to leave yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Let it. Yeah. Let it. You know, put it aside for a moment. Let it. Let it settle. Yeah. Um, and then come back to it. And yeah. sometimes the poem will tell you, "I'm not done yet." Yeah. Sometimes the poem will tell will tell you, mm -hmm. "You're close, but not there." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. And I wanted. I wasn't sure how to end the poem. Mm -hmm. um, people focus on beginnings of poems. Yeah. Uh, ending a poem is also very, very hard sometimes. Yeah. Um, um, who was it? The, the French poet who said that a poem was never completed, it's barely abandoned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the 
I wasn't sure, quite sure how to abandon it. Mm -hmm. And I, and I. Well, you found a way to leave it open. Yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, come spring, I am, I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a beautiful, to me, it was the continuation of that theme. Um, another um, aspect of life that you have lean on um, quite often is food. <laughs> in, <Yes>. uh, <laughs> in, <laughs> you know, in um, so I have two questions about that. In in uh, in mindful eating, which is something I practice and teach others. Um, we talk about um, we're going now for at least nine hungers. And there is the obvious one, stomach hunger, and then there is eye hunger, and then there is mouth hunger, um, and then, you know, there is heart hunger. So which hunger are your poems most often trying to satiate? Nose hunger. Nose hunger. <laughs> There's a great... Um story i'll try to condense it a little bit uh about i think it's a chinese parable actually mm. about the beggar who stands outside of a lovely bakery yeah um inhaling the scent of fresh baked scent. goods yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and the owner of the bakery becomes incensed because then mm -hmm. he sues him and brings him to court and mm -hmm. ultimately i'm making this much shorter and he prevails and the judge says um did you collect any change today begging and he says yes he says, jiggle the coins in your pocket. And the mm -hmm. man does. And he says to the bakery owner, those are your damages. The sound of his money for the scent of your bread. Yes. And I love that. I mm -hmm. love that story. Yeah. I, that is so sweet to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's when, when Proust uh, was led to write Remembrance mm -hmm. of Things Past, by the sense of Madeleine's. If you walk into a home and you smell mm -hmm. whatever it might be, chocolate chip cookies, apple pie, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. I mean, I don't know, realtors will tell you that you should big an apple pie mm -hmm. uh, if you're trying to sell a house. And there's a yes. reason for that. <laughs> there, it, is it, a, it there is a logic to that. There, there, there's absolute logic yeah. to it. Either that mm -hmm. or you can sell a pie, I suppose, if mm -hmm. the house doesn't go through. Um, but that that ah mm -hmm. the smell of cherry tobacco makes mm -hmm. me think of my father mm -hmm. the smell of a certain perfume will make me think of my mom mm -hmm. the smell mm -hmm. of of lilacs will make me think of somebody else mm -hmm. you know um th those smells linger long after all others are gone so not so much the actual taste hunger. Mm. I mean, given my diminished appetite, I'm really voraciously mm -hmm. hungry these days. Mm. Um, but that sense of nasal hunger. Yeah, yeah. To walk into someplace and- And what and it can it, evoke. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm thrilled when somebody reads a poem that I've written about food and says, mm. oh, that makes, makes me want to have a pastrami mm. sandwich now. My. Which is, high, I think it's high praise. You were like, <laughs> I have arrived. Exactly. Um, um, but that sense of, yeah, I, could, I, I know that smell. Yeah, yeah. I know that. And, and, it's a, and I think this power of scent and fragrance is so important. Mm. Going back to what I was saying, that there seems to be in 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 most of your poems, there is always the political, you know, running through. And in your poem, Lansky's favorite dish, <laughs> you draw several. I don't know how you 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 come to find these particular historical events, but um, I get it. <laughs> you draw several parallels in the lives of organized crime figures. Yes. And you give us kind of like a multicultural depiction of yes. um, organized crime paired yes, with a, the delight a... of food, yes. right? Yes. Um, you then, though, end with a plea of 
almost redemption for the yes. scenes of your youth. Yes. Um, what was this? Can you talk about that? that of course, process? of course. It was, it was um, as I'm, you, you may do this as well. Sometimes you peruse old books. I, when I was a child, I perused encyclopedias uh, or I read the dictionary. Now I yeah. just go online and just look up bizarre things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and this was a, a, a website devoted to the culinary habits of organized prime figures. Incredible. Which is bizarre, just truly bizarre. And I can only imagine that because these people were under constant surveillance by the FBI, mm -hmm. the FBI was monitoring what they ate, so perhaps they could poison them. I don't know. Right. I don't have no idea why. But somebody mm -hmm. made a note as to what Meyer Lansky or Bugsy Siegel or Lucky Luciano liked to eat. And I thought, oh my God, there's got to be a poem in here somewhere. And I thought of all the things to remember about Meyer Lansky, that's what they're remember. That's what they're memorializing. That they like blintzes, blintzes. Lucky Luciano, <laughs> like like dill pickles. Yeah. And there was a whole but, report to the FBI, right, right. from the FBI's field officer to his his supervisor. That yeah. Lucky Luciano liked pickles. Yeah. And and I thought to myself at the end of our days. How nice to be remembered for the food we like, as opposed to all the things we've done. All the things that, and that's, be, I mean, that ending of your poem is so powerful because, you know, capturing the, the you know, the young you, the innocent. The, yes. Well, that, right? I, I deliberately, I lifted, I lifted a line from the New Testament. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So I, I, I was, I, I lifted, I lifted a line or two from, uh, from the it's Gospels. Beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. So one um, one last question here about um, going back to voices of poetry. You have now what nine million? Oh God, I, we have we have it's it's my we have ninety nine hundred members around the globe. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Um, including in Ukraine, including uh -huh. in Russia. Uh -huh. uh, including in the occupied territories in, in, in Israel, in Palestine. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, um, and the diversity of those voices um, is astounding. We have a whole range of nationalities, a whole uh -huh. range of, uh -huh. of beliefs. Uh, a, yeah. a whole, we, have, we have Sufis, we have, we have uh -huh. Shiites, we, uh -huh. have, we have Sunni Muslims. We have Orthodox Jews. We have agnostics. We have secular humanists. Mm -hmm. We have Baha'i. Mm -hmm. We have um, we have people who are Hindu. Um, mm -hmm. We have fundamentalists. We have evangelicals. Mm -hmm. um, we all get along because we all value the, the written and spoken word. Yeah, is nobody that tries convert, nobody yeah. tries to convert anybody else? Yeah. So is that the the biggest lesson that? this collective space has taught you about humanity? Yeah, uh, I think When so. we find, like, yeah, how I will you put it? it that, that, we, that we've made common cause, as it were. Mm -hmm. That we've made common cause. Mm -hmm. That um, as much as I love to share my own, you know, bizarre fascinations with, um, with poetry and music, mm -hmm. um, whether it's Jimmy Page playing a piece by Chopin mm -hmm. or... Um, the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, mm -hmm. or a piece by Mahmoud Darwish, uh, one of my favorite poets. Yeah, um, yeah, I um, we, We've made common cause, mm -hmm. and especially, especially in these times. And I, I don't mm -hmm. want to sound too much like a, a like a political polemicist, mm -hmm. but the, the spoken word is so vitally important. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if ultimately what we say or write will make a difference, mm -hmm. but we keep on saying it and writing it in, mm -hmm. in, in the hope that it will. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think the fact that so many has joined and, and stayed, because sometimes we so. go to communities, right? And yes. we realize, oh, this is not for me, right? And we yeah. leave. Um, but the fact that so many people stayed 
speaks yes. to the nature, the embracing nature of. I hope of so. The I hope so. I hope so, and I hope mm -hmm. that I that I am creating and fostering a safe space mm -hmm. where people can feel comfortable um, mm -hmm. without you know, homophobia, without mm -hmm. uh, Islamophobia, without mm -hmm. the bigotry, without prejudice mm -hmm. of any variety. Um, you know, yeah. the one thing we want to tolerate is intolerance. Yeah, yeah, um, and and I think you've done a, a marvelous job in terms of intercepting um you know uh lines that can be damaging oh absolutely oh my gosh you you, know. you are not shy <laughs> no. in doing that no. so <laughs> I, I'm, I, I am a child of new york shyness is not my strong suit so that's that's important is there um something i have not asked that you think is important for people to know about you or oh, gosh. anything that um, you want? No, I think, I think just, I, I applaud you for what you're doing, Marinella, and mm -hmm. what you've done so beautifully, um, mm -hmm. your own work, both on the page and in, in doing what you do now, mm -hmm. um, which is to recognize that poetry, spoken word, music is indeed healing. I mean, mm -hmm. um, there is a reason why even Tony Bennett, for example, good example, mm -hmm. Tony Bennett has advanced Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And yet the moment he starts singing a song, the, the, the age, the years fall away mm -hmm. and the words come back to him and the music comes back to him. That's the power of words. And there, there, there is no medical explanation for that. Mm -hmm. There's no, the, you know, we can't, you know, take slivers of the brain and figure, ah, oh, mm -hmm. here's why. Mm -hmm. There's no pill that you can take, yeah. which will say, well, this will reverse Alzheimer's. Here, take a song by Gershwin, take a song by Kern, uh, <laughs> take a song by Irving Berlin, and, and, you know, and you'll be fine. Um, well, there is that proposal, though. That's what poetry is, that's therapy does. <laughs> exactly. But, and that's not unique to Tony Bennett. There was a, a woman who, um, was a, a ballet dancer and she was mm. uh, in her close to maybe she was actually over 100 and she was listening to a tape of of uh, swan's lake swan lake mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you saw you saw her hands mm -hmm. gliding through mm -hmm. the air as she once yeah. did yeah. It, that music that yeah. motion that or poetry or spoken word mm -hmm. um speaks to us the way nothing else can yeah yeah. It, it cuts through, mm -hmm. it cuts through um, languages, it cuts through cultures, it cuts through pain, mm -hmm. ideally, mm -hmm. it cuts through alienation, yeah. Um, yeah. and it reaches out and says to somebody, you're not alone, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you're not alone. Yeah. And that is uh, when art is at its most meaningful. Mm -hmm. To establish the human connection. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, and, and that's what we try to do. Yeah. Thank you so much because you just um, summarized so well the idea, the spirit behind um, this uh, series of interviews. Oh, I'm so, so glad. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Neil. And Thank you all for listening to What a Word is Worth. You can access today's interview at Anchor, YouTube, and other platforms. And if you're interested, if you like what you hear today, hit the subscribe button and in your podcast app. And also leave us a review. Let us know how you like this. I am with you in love and, and compassion, always, always, always. <laughs> Thank you so 